We've been talking about the uh, idea of here I stand. It was based on Martin Luther and the book that uh, Eric Metaxas wrote. Uh, it's a powerful thing. And you see Martin Luther in 1500s and he's fighting for the truth of the scriptures. And uh, he comes to a point where the religious elite are very aggravated by what he is doing. And he, the, he is then asked to recant all that he has said and written. And uh, the famous moment came when he stood before the elite, the religious elite, the political powers that be of those days in the 1500s, and he said, I will not recant. Here I stand. I can do no other. So God help me. Amen. It's a great, a great statement, a powerful stand. But I want you to know that there were a lot of things that happened in his life before he found himself in front of this ruling council of this room packed full of people uh, wanting him to recant what he had said, wanting him to stop stirring things up that was causing troubles in a church that was not abiding by what the Bible had taught. The text today is in Matthew 7, verses 24 to 27. And it says this, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds his house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears these words of my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. It's a great story. Jesus has been preaching the most famous sermon ever preached. The best sermon you've ever heard on the planet. We weren't there, but we get to read it. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter five, six, and seven. And he's concluding this most famous sermon. And he says there are, there are just times when you have to get to the core of issues. You've got to get down to the bottom line. And you've got to decide what kind of life are you going to build. He'd been doing this incredible teaching. If you ever read the Sermon on the Mount lately, I encourage you to get the Bible out and turn to Matthew and read chapters 5, 6, and 7. It's just a powerful, practical sermon. You would think it was written recently. It's so applicable to us even today, thousands of years later. There are times we read the Bible and it's unclear as to what it is saying or what it means. Not everything is as black and white sometimes as some of the things we read and understand right away what is being said and what we're supposed to do with it. Most weeks I'm pulling Bible dictionaries or commentaries off shelves or, uh, that are on my computer and to see what scholars have said about a particular passage of the Bible. There are weeks when uh, scholars, I, I read scholars who see things differently, and that's, that's okay. I, that doesn't bother me, and I can value all the different thoughts they, they might uh, pose in the thinking of different passages of Scripture. Basically, if you, if you wind that tape back to where all this started, it's how we got denominations, basically. There was no such thing as denominations, but as different groups began to see Scripture a certain way, they would find it to be a good idea to break off and, and build their church around this, this concept or that one, and that's basically uh, how we ended up with a variety of denominations and different viewpoints on certain things in the Scriptures, most of which I would say are convictional in nature, not principles. And we still unite, I believe, around, by and large, the principles of Scripture. There are weeks when I'm looking at these writings of scholars and they will see things differently, but there are moments, and this week was one of them, when it's just straightforward. It's crystal clear. It's to the point. It's obvious. Jesus tells some really hard truth in this sermon. And then he ends it with a very practical application in other words, now that you have heard this, here's what you are to do with it. And you have two options. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and will put them into practice is wise. And everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't put them into practice is foolish. Crystal clear. No other point needed, no other explanation needed. It's crystal clear. 
You've heard these words, put them into practice, you're wise. Ignore them, you're a fool. And and as he concludes this great sermon, it's as if he's saying to them, I've told you many, many things in this message. And the the things he touches on in this Sermon on the Mount are so life-changing and so practical. So he's saying, I've told you many things in this sermon, so let me just summarize it, show you what to do next. Let me tell you what is most important. And he gives some instructions, this advice that we've just read. He encourages them to choose a life that will be built on the rock because that's where the wise will build. I made a comment last week in one of our rooms, I don't think I said it in all of them, but there are times when you're around someone, and certainly as a pastor, it's been a privilege to be able to be with someone uh, whose life will soon end. Sometimes it's in a hospital room, and sometimes it's in a hospital bed in their home, and the doctors have said that it could be any time. Sometimes you don't get a chance to have a conversation, to say anything really. Sometimes the the body has already uh, in some ways shut down and there are no more words. There's no eye contact. There's nothing to say or be said. We still are told by physicians, talk to them anyway and let them know you love them and pray with them. There are those moments when you, you go see someone that you've known a long time and the end is very near. And I've had the great privilege of being at times the recipient of someone who is near death who speaks words of gold to me. Sometimes they're encouraging. Sometimes they will give me maybe a thought on the future of our church. I've been encouraged, just stay the course. Or maybe there's a tough decision coming and, and, and some great saint would say, don't back away from it. Great words of encouragement. The, the, the little time they have left, if they're still able to communicate, they're trying to say things that we can hold on to. Say things that will mean something to us for the rest of our lives. So Jesus tells this story. He knows now that he needs to help them apply it, what he has said. And he tells us about two men then who had three things in common. Each one built a house. Each one heard the words of Jesus and each one encountered a storm. They had all, those, those two, the wise and the fool, they had three things in common. They each were gonna build something, they each had heard the words of Jesus, and they each would encounter violent storms in their life. What a, what a blessing it is when Jesus tells us, this life's not gonna be easy. You're gonna have trials of many kinds. Buckle up, but be prepared. And and these two men, the wise and the fool, they they have these three things in common, but they also each had a choice as to how they might respond to the words that they had heard. Again, I'm repeating it on purpose. If you're wise, you'll build a house on the rock, solid ground. If you're a fool, you'll build your life on sand, So the first details are given. You're going to build something. We all are building a life. We can either build character, build our souls, fuel our minds, or we can give it no thought. We can ramble through life with minimal concern or direction for anything specific. The materials you construct a house with, the materials we use to build a life, are the choices we make. These choices are often underestimated details. And I've learned in those details of life, that's where the devil is really in the details. If you read stories of great spiritual religious leaders, you'll find that it was in the downtime, the quiet time, away from the crowds, where they would be so severely tried and tempted. The devil is really in the details. You hear that a lot. Any project you're working on, if you're building a house, you know, you're going to find out, boy, man, the devil's sure in the details, isn't he? We thought everything was fine here. It looks good, but it doesn't work. Something's wrong. New Testament scholar uh, Tom Wright, N.T. Wright, said, in Jesus' day, the old way to God, the old system, was symbolized by the temple. And the temple was built in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount, or called the Temple Rock. And it was, among other things, known as the house on the rock. And Jesus says... 
the house on the rock in the future is not the temple. It's a new community of people who build their lives on my words, Jesus said. It's a staggering claim for people listening in those days. That's why the religious people and the Pharisees were all in such an uproar. There was a new covenant, love others as I've loved you. The Hebrew writer in uh, Hebrews 11 verse 10 said that Abraham was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God, not humans. The old practice of physical circumcision would no longer be necessary. The new covenant was a circumcision of the heart. So Jesus is really clear. Hear these words, put them into practice, you're wise. And Jesus says, I am that rock. I am that foundation. So everyone is building something. Everyone is building a life. Our life will consist of the choices we make in the, in the dark times, the down times, the times nobody's around. Our life will consist of every little decision we've made that didn't seem like a big deal. It wasn't quite right. It wasn't probably wise. It probably wasn't best for us. Didn't seem to create any harm. But our life will consist of these little tiny decisions we're going to make along the way. And all those little decisions add up. Just like when you're building a house, you ignore the details. And you're going to have a house that's a real pain. The second detail, each one in our story, these two, the wise and the foolish, they heard the same words. Jesus says that they've heard these words. Some of you will be wise and you'll apply these words. Some of you will be fools, you ignore these words. He's very clear about what is wise and what is foolish. And you have a choice. You can build your life either way. You do have the freedom. Isn't that awesome that God would, only, only God could give us the freedom to self-destruct. <laughs> only God would say, it's your choice, pal. I've given you everything possible for you to have a life that would be one you could not have imagined. And you ask anybody that's been following Jesus for any length of time, I'm one of those. It's hard to believe what God has in mind and what God has done that I was never planning most of it, I would have said, that's not going to happen. I can't do that. I mean, there's stories like that anywhere when you follow people or know people or hang out with people who follow Jesus. Each man heard the same words. Who will you listen to? One advice, piece of advice, you'll build a sturdy house, a sturdy life. The other voice, you'll, you'll just kind of float through life if you've ever built a house, think of all the choices that go into building it. What's the foundation going to be like? How thick is the concrete? Is it reinforced with steel? Is the dirt under the foundation firm and secure? Sometimes it takes piers in Oklahoma soil. You've got to, well, we're going to have to put a pier back on this corner or somewhere to make sure the foundation is really on solid ground, solid footing. For Jesus, it's pretty easy. It's rock or it's Sand, rock, or sand. As you're building a house, you'll probably have to make some decisions. Where do you want the light switches? Where do you want plugs? What kind of light fixtures? Want a fireplace or not? What about the heat and air? You want a system that'll last 20 years? Or you can save a whole lot of money and put a cheap one in now, and you'll have to replace it in about five to 10 years. Which way you want to go? It's going to cost you more in the long run. Do you want to go do it right now, or do you want to just... Cross your fingers and see what happens. There's a lot of decisions like that anytime you're building a house as well as building a life. And a good builder or architect will not tell you how wonderful the sand is. A good builder will not tell you that we can save a ton of money if we'll just build it on sand. Even though storms will come and most likely destroy the house. Who cares? Maybe we'll get lucky. Maybe no storm will come. Each man was going to build something in this story. Both of them heard the words of Jesus, and both of them would encounter storms. Those are the given. Talk about a storm. As I was going over this, I, I thought about the home we now live in. We bought it 10 years ago. <clears throat> 
It's 24 years old. We've become friends with the previous owner who built the house. We got to know their story at closing. We were stunned. A member of the, the Gladys Lewis has written a book on this experience, and Kim read it over the weekend after closing, and we were just, we, had it, we realized we have inherited a treasure here. Gladys Lewis built our house for her husband. He was a highly respected physician here in Oklahoma City. He was seriously injured in a skiing accident in Colorado at Copper Mountain, a place we've skied almost every year when our kids were growing up. I knew right where it happened. This is a couple who served as medical missionaries in faraway places, a couple who did everything in their life for the purpose of pointing people to Jesus. And in one moment, he was a very successful physician, a very fit and energetic man. In the next moment, he was a ventilator-dependent quadriplegic. And what made it even more frustrating or perhaps aggravating or even sad is Dr. Lewis was not coming down the mountain as fast as he could and then run into a tree or something. That's not what he did. He was just scooting to take the skis off and go in and have lunch. And there was an unmarked tragic hazard that no one could have seen. So after a year of hospitals in Colorado and Oklahoma, they thought he would live maybe 10 minutes. He lived 12 years. And a lot of it is the way Gladys handled this crisis when the storms came to their life. She decided she will take care of her husband at home. She decided she would do whatever it would take. And she made this heroic decision to design a house that would work for their context. There was a generator since there was, he was the ventilator dependent. If the power went out, he died. The back part of this home was like a hospital. And every day, this man was allowed some normalcy. Rather than just being set aside, or rather than assuming the task was too great, she made all these little tiny decisions along the way that added up to a phenomenal story, a phenomenal experience, and we became the owners of this treasured place. <laughs> and I find myself constantly, when I'm working around, you know, putzing around, doing stuff in the yard or up in the attic, I'll be saying, oh, Gladys, if I could, I'm just going to call Gladys, thank you so much for not cutting any corners. 24 years later, thank you so much. Everywhere I turn, I see a decision you made and it's made my life better because I'm not having to fix all this stuff because you chose a lesser road. We all have a decision to determine how we're going to build. Not material things. You know where I'm going with this. But our life. And I believe the enemy, the devil himself, shows up very quietly when you least expect him to distract you, to help you justify a simple decision or sometimes a big decision, rock or sand. And in that moment, you think sand should be okay. But over time, you're going to find out sand is dangerous. The devil really is in the details. I think it's easy to think, as I've been talking about here I stand, that we all are gonna have this great moment somewhere in life and we're gonna just take our stand. It's coming, I'm gonna take my stand, boy. I'm gonna stand up for God, I'm gonna stand up for my faith. I'm gonna be very clear that I follow Jesus, you know, and we're gonna take our stand. Now there's time for that, no question about it. And thank God for the men and women in history who've taken those stands. For a community, for their church family, for Jesus in the public square. There are moments where you do. You, you might get the privilege of stepping up in front of some people and just stand up for what you believe. But most of life is going to be taking a stand, maybe just in your place of work, or maybe in the neighborhood, maybe with your family. Every great stand taken for Jesus 
was preceded by many simple, unknown, and usually unseen decisions to do the right thing and trust Jesus in the difficult moments. Before Martin Luther took his stand in the city of Worms in front of the emperor and the religious leaders, he had made many small stands. If you read the journey as all the way through the, the path that would ultimately land him in front of the, the most powerful people on the planet at that time, every little conversation along the way, maybe one person here, a group, or a few here, was a simple stand he had taken. If you read the book, it's tempting. When I, I'd heard the story about Luther taking a stand, here I stand, I can do no other. But it was tempting when I got the book to go read chapter 10 first. <laughs> I want to read the story about when Luther took that stand. That's, that sounds intriguing. That sounds really cool. I want to go to, you want to go to chapter 10 and, and read that big chapter, you know. No doubt it was a historic moment when Luther took this firm stand and knowing it could mean the end of his life. But you've got to read the first nine chapters that will tell you the many ways Luther was taking a stand, one person at a time, one conversation at a time, one situation at a time, one group of people at a time, where he would answer questions with integrity, he stayed true to what he believed, even if it was just a few people asking. By the time he'd been called to face the powerful religious leaders of the world, by the time that took place, taking his stand and being clear and firm about what he believed was nothing new to him. We see it as heroic because he took this stand in the face of risking his own life. For him, it was just what you do. He'd been answering the question a long time, will you recant what you've written? He'd been, no, I'm not gonna do that. So by the time the big moment came, he didn't even pause. I can do no other. I'm bound by the scriptures. Let the chips fall where they may. And taking a stand for what you believe to be true will never be effective if you don't prepare for it in the small things, in the details. And the problem we have is we think we can cruise through the small things, that those little details don't matter. We think we can hide the reality. If you're building a house of a misplaced light switch or a light that won't turn on because there's no wire leading to it, why have a light you can't turn on? Somebody forgot to run a wire. Somebody thought it was no big deal. Somebody didn't check to see if everything was working. Someone thought they could hide those details, just like we try to hide some details in our own lives. And you end up with a life that works some of the time, or a house that works mostly, but not all the time. There's a famous house <clears throat> out in California, I think it's San Jose, and I, I've read about it many, many years ago, and, I, and the story uh, popped up somewhere, and I thought, I'm going to see if that's even still around. Does that mean, how real is that story? You know, pre preachers sometimes, we tell stories that might be a little bit, you know, we maybe add a few things to them. Preachers are good at that. I'm not. I'm not one of those guys at all. I would, I would never embellish something just, just to try to get you to make a decision. <laughs> there, there was just an example. The devil's in the details. I just told a lie in front of all kinds of people. Right there. I just did it. Right there. So let the record stand. I'm in this boat with you. So there's this house. It's, it's there. I mean, it is still there. You can tour it. You can go see it. It's called the uh, Winchester Mystery House. It's a fascinating house to go through. The woman who built it was named Winchester, Mrs. Winchester, because her husband was the Winchester rifle guy. So she was heir to all this money. But he died, then their only child died, and so she and her loneliness turned to the occult. And apparently, they say, Mrs. Winchester developed this kind of odd belief that as long as she kept building this house, death would be confused. So she built this bizarre house trying to confuse the evil one from coming after her. That's what this religion she had adopted would lead her to do. She builds this enormous house, 
Six carpenters worked every day for 38 years. Look it up, Google it. It contains 2,000 doors in this house, 160,000 windows, more windows than in the Empire State Building. The front doors of this house cost $3,000, and in that day, you could build one really nice house for $3,000. This is in the late 1800s. She spent all that on the front doors, and they were used one time. The workmen who installed them walked out of them after they put them in. That's the only time the doors were ever used. Never opened again. You'll find doors all over this house that go nowhere. You can open doors that open to a brick wall. Because apparently part of the deal in building this house was she was hoping that she could confuse death so it couldn't find her. She was still building this house when death came and death was not confused. It took eight trucks working seven days a week for six and a half weeks just to haul the extra stuff she had piled up in that house. And then there was a truck that made one more trip and that one was for her. Because no matter what kind of house you build, that truck's gonna come. It's gonna come for all of us. That's a constant. We can't get around that, I wish we could, but we can't. We think we can hide the reality of things in our lives and get away with it at some level, but there will come a day when you might have the privilege of looking in the mirror before it's too late and face the truth of your own fraud. And even if you're the only one who knows the truth about yourself, it will be painful to face. And then you have to decide, I've tried the sand and it just didn't work. Am I ready to do the hard work of life on the rock? of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 7, what if we could ask the foolish man why he thought he could get away using sand? Are you just too lazy? Did you not care? Are you too cheap? We're building a life here, folks. And Jesus has given us a choice in how we build it. Rock or sand. And there's a vast difference between the two vast difference between the two and we must choose a pastor that I respect greatly John Ortberg had written this statement out about the choices we make he said no one plans to lead a mediocre life I mean who does that no couple getting married sits down and says let's probably plan on divorce at some point no one walks into a bar and says I think I'll become an alcoholic no one has ever has a child and says, I'll, I think I'll remain cold and distant and let the school and the neighborhood or even the church raise this kid. Even with the church involved, you choose to stay distant as a parent and that child's gonna have a hole in their heart for years to come. No parents have children and think they'll just yell at them and be harsh and exasperate them like the Bible says we're capable of doing, men, and then wonder why they raise angry kids. No one plans to be a bitter, angry, resentful old person before they die. But every one of us will have a choice in those little details and hundreds of others. Could we be honest enough to at least admit to ourselves that perhaps we've been choosing sand or we're trying to have a little bit of both and it just doesn't work. You cannot take a stand on sand. There's no way. And your life can either be about the secure confidence of building on the rock or the never-ending chaos of storm avoidance. Those are our choices. And I'm hoping to have convinced some people today to quit messing in the sand. It will always deliver what it's already delivered. It will not keep its promises. It will not hold you firm. Choose to build on a rock. Maturity comes when we become aware that this is going to be a lifelong battle and we make our minds, we make our minds up to engage in it on a daily basis. So rock or sand. Rock is there for folks who want to make a difference. 
They want to step up and be the person God's equipped them to be. It's one or the other, rock or sand. And you've got to choose which one you want. Stand with me as we pray. Let me just give you like 30 seconds of silence if you're sitting in your home in front of a TV or a computer screen or sitting in one of our rooms or one of our prisons where people are worshiping with us today. Take just 30 seconds. Process what's going through your mind right now and make a decision. Father, how we thank you for the power of your holy word. How we thank you for how practical it is. Father, there's nothing really hard to understand about this great sermon that Jesus preached and this great last few paragraphs where he brings it all down to a decision. This is really clear. It's simple. Father, I pray you would Stir our thoughts and our hearts and our thinking, our minds. Help us, Father, to take a good inventory about how we're building and what kind of life are we building and what's our vision for the future of our life. And Father, I pray for people that would have the courage to say, I've got to get out of the sand and I have to step up on the rock. And Father, I pray there would be those around them who would say, I'll walk with you. I've been in sand too. Let me be with you as we together start over on the rock. Father, it's a critical moment in our world. And only you know how desperately we need and you need people who say they believe all that you have said in the Bible and yet have never really had to take a step or take a stand for it. Father, give us courage to step up and show that life on the rock is the most loving, gracious way to live in the love of Jesus Christ who gives us the strength to do the right thing. So today, we pray that we'll at least give it some thought. And we pray, Father, you will convict us until we've at least had the courage to at least call out what really is about our life and admit where we are and then decide if we want to stay there or if we want to take another step to life on your rock. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.